is just one of the Mission Jurassic quarries, and in front of me is an amazing skeleton of a dinosaur. This is a sauropod, that's one of the long necks, long tailed dinosaurs, the barrel body and the tiny head. It shows that when this animal was rolled along by the current, it was still held together by sinew and tissue. But all this mass would have been rolled together in this one cataclysmic event. Why did the dinosaur disappear? Um, they say because of meteorites. Well, I'm gonna believe what scientists say and that a meteor hit the earth and, you know, caused them to go extinct. Uh, comet. Comet? Yeah. My understanding is that there was a big meteor that came crashing from out of space all the way into the earth and, well, bam, dinosaurs were gone. The dinosaurs were taking up too much room? Yeah, they were taking too much room. I believe they went into hiding. They couldn't evolve through the process. They went into hiding? Yeah, after the destruction that happened. So just they just finished evolving? Yeah. They had nowhere else to go? Yeah. What happened to the dinosaurs? They never existed. You think all the dinosaur bones they're digging up are sort of plastic ones that someone put there for someone to dig up because it's a, a worldwide hoax? Exactly. So some gypsy got rid of the dinosaurs? Yes. And I'm pretty sure there's evidence to back this up that an asteroid came and put the earth in into a condition that dinosaurs couldn't live in. I was told it was because of a giant meteorite that wiped them from the planet. Do you believe that? Uh, not entirely. Why would you doubt it? Well, there's no actual proof of it happening. They say Pangaea coming apart was because of the meteorite and all that stuff, but I don't know. Uh, a comet, right? A comet just hit them? Well, it hit the area, and then I assume that something happened with a food chain. To the dinosaurs, I think when Pangaea split up, I think they probably just starved. They were just really old and they died, or that probably did happen with the meteorite. They just starved? Yeah, they didn't have any food. They couldn't, I mean, once they ate each other, what else was there to eat? I believe that that meteor that struck Earth got rid of them. Just hit a lot of them? Yeah, it just took all of them. I mean, I think pretty sure that some bacteria was left over or something, but in other words, yeah, all of living life. I was walking on four legs, pretty sure died. Just the dinosaurs or everything? Oh no, everything. Like, I'm talking about like lizards, you know, like elephants, tigers, you know. How did it start again? Organisms, um, you know, reproducing, you know, creating life again. Male and female? Um, probably. Probably? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe? It, it depends. You don't know, do you? I don't know, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure, you know, like, they, you know, like, as, as humans, you know, we're constructed as humans, females, depending on the genes, you know, X and Y. I'm pretty sure it, it determined that Y, that way, too. You constructed us. Oh, uh, I, I don't believe in a god, but... I You said we were constructed. What do you mean? Oh, like, we were built by, like, yeah, cells, you know, cells and... Cells built themselves? No, but they... they Where did they come from? <laughs> Is it constructed? Yes. It's got to be a constructor if there's a construction. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So you're still an atheist or have you changed your mind? Hmm, I guess I'm still an atheist then. Let me see if I can change your mind. Do you believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything? You do have a point there. And uh, I don't believe that nothing created everything. So you're not an atheist? So it's, yeah, I guess technically not, not an atheist. So you've changed your mind. I just changed my mind. And they weren't able to eat, and they weren't able to evolve to the point where they could survive that, so they died. It could have been like, you know, other dinosaurs, perhaps they caused a bit too much competition. They ate them? Yeah, that could definitely be something that happened. Maybe uh, global climate, maybe something changed and it caused them all to pass away. What caused it? I, I'm not sure, you know, studies say maybe a big explosion, maybe smoke, maybe a volcano. Maybe something caused the world to be very cold or very hot. Like a volcano? Yeah, probably, like something like that, maybe. Do you think dinosaurs were chickens? Yeah. About a million years after the time of Vigavis II, the asteroid struck Earth and redirected the evolutionary paths of many animals, including birds. So the next time you're looking out at your bird feeder, remember that you're looking at the modern-day dinosaurs. 
and t up until now, their scientists are doing their best to try to figure out what happened to them. They don't know. They don't know. We've collected enormous numbers of bones, and from them we can tell how these creatures lived, what they looked like, when they lived, but we don't know why they disappeared. Why is it that in Wyoming they've just found a hundred dinosaur fossils and they're intact? And they say it was a massive amount of water that killed them, took them all away. These are dinosaurs, so it must have been catastrophic. It shows that when this animal was rolled along by the current, it was still held together by sinew and tissue. There are a plethora of imaginative ideas and theories as to why the dinosaur disappeared. The impact exploded with a detonation greater than five billion atomic bombs. Change whether it was caused by volcanoes or an asteroid are probably pretty obvious. But the thing is, we're not sure how exactly this led to the dinosaur wipeout. It's like trillions upon trillions of meteors hitting the atmosphere all at the same time. Namely, global warming. It may feel like a modern phenomenon, but global warming and climate change did, and hypothetically would have, caused major problems for the dinosaurs too. So the motion of the solar system in the galaxy, like a hobby horse in a merry-go-round, could in fact have wiped out the dinosaurs. Their dominance was unchallenged. Except by other dinosaurs. There are those who believe a singular asteroid struck dry land. Others believe it struck the ocean. Others believe that there were many asteroids, or that asteroids ushered in what they call the Ice Age, which killed the dinosaurs. But one thing is sure, they really don't know. Do you think there's an afterlife? An afterlife? Hmm, I don't know, it depends, because it could tie into religion, but... <sighs> I don't know, I'm not that type of a religious person, but like... Do you believe in God's existence? Um, I'd rather not say. Do you believe there's an afterlife? Uh, no. So you're an atheist? Not really, but I feel like once you die, like, there's nothing else. So you live a hopeless existence, you have no hope in your death? I'm Isn't that depressing? No, because I really don't think about it. Well, you should, because your dog's gonna die. Grandma's going to die, your mum and dad are going to die, you're going to die. So what's the point of the whole exercise? If you've got no hope in your death, then your life is hopeless. Do you believe the Bible? I don't know, I, have, I kind of strayed away from religion. Do you ever read the Bible? Uh, occasionally. Do you know it speaks of what seems to be a dinosaur in Job chapter 40? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's the biggest creature God ever made. In Job 40 verse 15, God himself speaks to Job of a creature he created called Behemoth. Some Bible commentators believe this creature is a hippopotamus. Behold now Behemoth, which I made with you. He eats grass as an ox. Lo, his strength is at his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He who made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lies under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinks up a river. He hastens not. He trusts that he can draw up Jordan unto his mouth. He takes it with his eyes. His nose pierces through sneers. Science can only speculate as to why the dinosaur disappeared. But the answer may be in this passage of scripture. As we have seen, some commentators think this is a reference to the hippopotamus. However, one of the characteristics of this massive animal was that it had a tail that is likened to a cedar which is a very large tree. Clearly, the hippopotamus doesn't qualify. Here are the characteristics of this animal. It was the largest of all the creatures that God had made. It was plant-eating, that is, herbivorous. It had its strength in its hips, and a tail like a large tree. 
It had very strong bows, lived among the trees, drank massive amounts of water, and was not disturbed by a raging river. The Bible then says, He that made him can make his sword approach unto him. What happened to those land animals that didn't go on board the ark? They were drowned. Many of them turned into fossils. The dinosaur fossils we find, most of them probably come from the time of the flood. Many animals have become extinct, including the dinosaurs. Really, for animals to become extinct is nothing new. We see it happening every year. Do you believe in God's existence? Of course, I do. Do you think God's happy with you or angry at you? I'm always happy with you. I think there is an afterlife. I mean, you have to go somewhere. You can't just go to the ground, you know. So you think there's a heaven and a hell? I just think there got to be more than two options. So what happens after you die? Where do you go? Well, if you have faith in God, you know, and the Holy Spirit, then you know where you're going to go after that. Have you been born again? I haven't been born again, but I have been baptized. Now, what about you? Have you been born again? Um, in my religion, born again is being baptized. It's different from baptism. It's in John chapter 3, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you'll not enter heaven. In fact, the Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So a child, a baby, an infant, can't repent. Have I been born again? Um, no, I haven't. I don't think I have, not. Are you familiar with John chapter 3, where Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God? So what does that mean? Shouldn't you find out? What's the world's biggest selling book of all time? Oh, the Bible? Yeah, the Bible. Now, you're familiar with the story with the rich young ruler. He came running to Jesus and said, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You're not familiar with that? No, not that story. How would you answer that question, What should I do to inherit eternal life? But before you answer it, I'm going to give you a scenario. You wake up one morning, there's a lump under your arm. It really hurts. You go to the doctor and say, Doc, there's a lump under my arm. And he says, let me look at it. He looks, at, he looks a bit worried and goes off, does some tests, comes back and says, I'm sorry, this is lymph node cancer. You've got two weeks to live because this is metastasized. I'm so sorry. And he gives you some drugs to ease the pain. And you go home and you lie on your bed. You're not thinking about sex, pornography, sport, travel. You're feeling sick as a dog because the drugs have got side effects. And you're thinking to yourself, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Because you've only got two weeks to live. Put yourself in that scenario and answer that question for me. Honestly, that's a hard one. I wouldn't know what to do on the top of my head. Well, let me, let me tell you what Jesus said to that man. Remember he said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. You ask most people, do you think you're a good person? And they'll say yes. And that's because we're ignorant of God's standard of goodness. Good in the dictionary, number one definition is moral excellence. So let me ask you a question and then do what Jesus did. He asked that question, then went through five of the Ten Commandments. So I'm going to do that to see if I can show you something real important in your life. Do you think you're a good person? No. So you've done some pretty evil things? Yeah. You've lied and stolen? Yeah. So you're a lying thief? Yeah. Do you think you're a good person? Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a good person. How many lies have you told in your life? Oh, that's a, uh, that's a tough question there. You know, I'm not an angel, but I do get my halo dirty once in a while, so can't say. So how many lies do you think you've told in your life? 10, 20, 100? I think I've said... Did you just blaspheme the name of Jesus then? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I think 20 lies. Uh, have I been baptized? No, have you been born again? I'm born again every day when I wake up, I feel like. Hello? Oh. <laughs> That's a good attitude for life, but you know, Jesus said you must be born again to enter heaven. So this is essential. So I'm going to try and convince you that you need to be born again. I'm going to try and convince you that God is your enemy. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you believe you're in terrible danger? I mean, at the moment, I don't think so. Do you think God is happy with you or angry at you? Um, I think that he's happy, but I wouldn't doubt that there are times I disappoint him. 
So you do things that anger him? Um, probably. Such as? Well, um, I go out and I party a lot and I drink and I smoke and... Nothing wrong with having a party. You're talking about looking at pornography and fornicating with women? Um, mostly, yeah. I think he's pretty happy. I haven't done nothing bad. What do you consider to be bad? Uh, murder, rape, stuff like that. What about lying and stealing? Blasphemy and adultery and fornication. Are they bad in God's eyes? Yeah, they are. How do you know that? That's what I've been told by my parents. The parents Christians? Yeah. If heaven exists, are you a good person? Are you going to make it there? I don't know if that's for me to say, but... You're a good person? I hope so. I'll try to be. You're never doing anything that offends God or could anger Him? Possibly. Are you a good person, basically? I try to be. I think you're in big trouble. I think there is a comet heading for you and you don't know it. You're in great danger and I want to see if I can help you understand that. Do you think God is happy with you or angry at you? Um, happy? So you're not doing anything that could offend God? No, I'm here living the best life as He would intend. Is God happy with you? Yes. I'm going to try and convince you otherwise. Um, I'll put you on trial just for a minute. You're studying criminal justice. I'm going to be a prosecutor. You be the defendant. All I want from you is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. Can you do that? Yes. Okay, so here, here's a cross-examination using the moral law of the Ten Commandments. How many lies do you think you've told in your life? A lot. Too many to count. Too many to count. Under a hundred. I try not to lie. Oh, too many to count. What do you call someone who's told countless lies? A liar. Now, do you still think you're a good person? Yes. Have you ever stolen something, even if it's small in your whole life? Yes. What do you call someone who steals things? A thief. So what are you? A thief. No, you're a lying thief. <laughs> now, do you still think you're a good person? Yes. You think a lying thief is a good person? Well, I mean, uh, Jesus was crucified next to a thief, wasn't he? Yeah, what's that got to do with you? Are you saying you should be crucified or put to death for your crimes against God like that thief? Oh, yikes. I hope not. Well, you actually are. Don't you realize that? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Have you ever stolen something in your whole life? Mm. Irrespective of its value. No. On second thought, yeah. A thief? Yeah. So what are you? A thief. Is your mouth going dry? No, not really. Uh, yeah, when I was little. So what do you call someone who steals things? A stealer. No, a thief. A thief. So what are you? A thief. No, you're a lying thief. <laughs> Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. All the time. He lavished his kindness upon you, gave you eyes to see, ears to hear good music, taste buds to enjoy good food, love and laughter, friends and fellowship, beautiful weather, fruits and seasons, and you have used his name as a cuss word. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? Uh, no, not really. Because that, that would dishonor her. It would be a horrible thing to do. And when you use God's name as a cuss word, you dishonor him and anger him to a point where the Bible says the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Death sentence for blasphemy for using God's name as a cuss word in the Old Testament. It's like a judge in a court of law. He has a heinous criminal standing before him who's uh, raped three women and cut their throats. And the judge says, you go in an electric chair. You've earned this. This is what you deserve. This is your wages. And God is putting us to death, capital punishment, because our crimes against his law are that serious. Now Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Well, I think we all have at some point. <laughs> yeah. Have you had sex before marriage? No. You're a virgin? Yes. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yes. No. Are you homosexual? Uh, bisexual. Okay, have you looked at pornography? Yes. That's looking with lust. Honestly, in the past, I have, yeah. Everything's in the past. Even this sentence I'm saying now is in the past. Have you looked with lust? Yes. I have to. Okay. Have you had sex before marriage? Have I had sex before marriage? Uh, no comment. You know, when someone repeats a question, they're formulating a lie. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> so have you had sex before marriage? Uh, yeah. Lust? <laughs> I mean... Have you looked at pornography? <laughs> yes. That's, okay, that's lust. I mean, who hasn't? I mean, I feel that everyone has had lust for someone. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Have you had sex before marriage? Um, I don't want to say. Just plead the fifth. Plead the fifth. You had sex before marriage? Yeah. So I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, a fornicator, and an adulterer at heart. Do you still think God is happy with you? Uh, yeah. He's not. The Bible says his wrath abides upon you. You're an enemy of God in your mind through wicked works. And that's evidenced by the fact you use his name as a cuss word when he gave you life. David, I'm not judging you. You've just told me you're a lying, thieving, fornicating, blasphemous, adulterer at heart. So if God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Guilty? Heaven or hell? Hell. Now, can you see you're in great danger? Yes. I can't answer that right now. I still got a lot of time to change. Well, the Bible says all liars love their part in the lake of fire. And what makes you think you've got a lot of time to change? Remember what Jesus said of a man who said, I'm going to build bigger barns, I'm so rich. He planned for the future and God said, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. You don't know when you're going to die, David. You could be going to die in the next 12 hours. God forbid, but it could happen to each of us, any of us. So you've got to think of that. There's a sense of urgency. And if you died in your sins, you've got God's promise you'll end up in hell because he's seen your secret thoughts, those sexual imaginations, every deed done in darkness. He knows you by name, how many hairs are on your head. He knows every atom that makes up the 137 million light-sensitive cells in your eyes because he made every atom. And you have to face him on judgment day with all that sin. I'm not judging you, Angel, but you've told me you're a lying thief, a fornicator, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart. Do you still think you're a good person? Well, when you put it that way, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, not in God's eyes. In our own eyes we are. The Bible says every man will proclaim his own goodness. And we all do. We think we're good because we're, we're ignorant of God's standard of morality, a standard of righteousness. So here's the big question. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty? If I'm honest with myself, probably guilty. You can drop the probably. <laughs> Definitely. Would you go to heaven or hell? Hell. How does that concern you? Greatly. So, Huani, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, a fornicator, and an adulterer at heart. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Uh, guilty. Heaven or hell? Hell. Will you be innocent or guilty? What's your plea? I don't know. I mean, well, I feel that... Well, well the, the stuff that you just mentioned, I mean, it's everyday stuff that people do. The thing of a criminal who's uh, murdered a number of prostitutes, and he says to the judge, Judge, I'm not sorry. These were the scum of the earth. I did society a favor when I killed them. And the judge says, it's obvious you don't see the seriousness of your crime, so what I'm going to do is show you how serious the crime is. You're going to the electric chair. And as they strap you in, you might realize how serious it is to take the precious human lives of these three young women. We trivialize sin, but the thing that will bring sobriety to our minds is the fact that God has given us the death sentence for sin. The wages of sin is death. You'll die because you've sinned against God. That's how serious he sees sin. And after death, the judgment, you have to stand before God and you're up the river Niagara. You're without a paddle, without hope, without help. So what can you do to save yourself from the damnation of hell? Uh, don't know. Don't have an answer. Well, you're right. There's nothing you can do, but God has already done something. If you're guilty, you'll end up being damned by God. The Bible says all liars of their part in the lake of fire, no thief, no blasphemer, no adulterer will inherit God's kingdom. If you say to a judge, I committed that serious crime, I shot the guard after I robbed the bank, but I'm really sorry, I won't do it again. He'll say to you, you should be sorry, and of course you shouldn't do it again. Now you're going to jail. So being sorry and saying, I won't do it again, that's called repentance, cannot save you. The only thing that can save you is the shed blood of the Savior on that cross. That's where your faith has to go. And the way to get there is to repent and trust in Jesus. It's like turning to a parachute won't save you, but putting it on will. Can you see the difference? Yeah. Can you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's real important because most people say, I say I'm sorry to God, and they're not saved. They're not born again. And they do it again. And they do it again because they haven't got a new heart because they haven't been born again. Every time you sin, the book of Romans says you store up God's wrath and you make it worse for yourself for that day of judgment, a fearful thing. Yeah, you're standing right under the meteor of God's wrath. Jesus put it like this. He said, he that falls upon the stone shall be broken, which is conversion, but on whomsoever the stone shall fall, 
it shall grind him to powder. And he's speaking of God's justice. When you grind something to powder, you do a thorough job with it. Something's ground to powder, completely thorough job. And God's justice on Judgment Day is going to be very thorough. He's going to judge the thoughts and intents of our heart. He's going to judge the imaginations of our heart, things we've thought about, sexual imaginations, our lying, our stealing, our blasphemy. Jesus warned every idle word that a man speaks, he'll give an account thereof on the day of judgment. And so you should be concerned about losing your soul, being damned in hell, leaving everything beautiful that God's lavished upon you, eyesight and hearing and taste and the beautiful blue sky and flowers and birds and love and laughter. It's an end to all that at death if you die in your sins, and that horrifies me the thought of you ending up in hell, because you're a human being created in the image of God. So do you know what God did for guilty sinners so that you wouldn't have to go to hell? Any idea? Um, died on the cross for us, right? Uh, he sacrificed his son. Yeah. He was crucified. He died for our sins. He gave his only begotten son, yeah. Jesus. You and I broke God's law, the Ten Commandments. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. That's why he called out, it is finished, just before he died. And if you're in court and someone pays you fine, the judge can let you go. He can say... This guy's got a stack of speeding fines, but someone's paid him. He's out of here. He's free. And God can legally, like that judge, legally let you go free, all because of the death and resurrection of Christ on that cross. He can let you live forever because of what Jesus did through his death and resurrection. And here's the important part. What you must do is repent and trust in Christ. Now, repentance is an old-fashioned word. It's misunderstood by a lot of people. Most people think, it's just saying to God, I'm real sorry. But it's more than that. It's being genuinely contrite or sorry for your sins. And it means turning from sin perpetually or continually. You don't lie or steal or lust or fornicate or look at pornography as a professing Christian. All you do is deceive yourself and play the hypocrite. You don't fool God, only yourself. So you've got to be genuine in your repentance. You know, turn from all sin, including homosexuality and adultery and fornication. And trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. If you were going to jump out of a plane and didn't see your danger because you couldn't see gravity, the best thing I could do for you would be to hang you out the plane by your ankles for two seconds. Fear would kick in and you'd say, give me that parachute because fear has done you a favor. And today I, I trust you're a little fearful because I've hung you out eternity by your ankles just for two minutes to show you it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let fear drive you to the cross. Through the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil, the Bible says. So, man, get before the Lord and say, God, forgive me. And you know how God can forgive you and grant you everlasting life? Do you know how? Yes, I know. He died what, for our sins. Yes, he suffered and died on the cross. Have I convinced you that you're in terrible danger and you need to trust in Jesus? Yes. Did you last read your Bible? More, more than in like two, three years. It's been a while. So something's radically wrong. So please think about what we talked about. You know, prayer is us talking to God, and the Bible is God speaking to us, and we need to be swift to hear and slow to speak. You're going to think seriously about what we talked about? Yeah. What do you think football and driving a car have in common? Um, they're both controlled by people. Yeah, but they both have rules. And if you have no rules in football, what happens? Things get chaotic. Yeah. If you have no rules on the road when you're driving, what happens? Things get chaotic and out of control. Yeah, and so rules are actually good for us. And God created you with the apparatus to enjoy sex. But he says there's some rules within the bounds of marriage. If you don't, you're going to break the rules and you're going to get sexually transmitted disease, bring upon yourself guilt, dishonor a woman. And so there are just certain rules that make sense. So do you have a Bible at home? Yes, I do. Do you? No. Okay, well, you can get one on your phone. There's 20,000 apps. Do you have a Bible? I have five, I believe. Oh, one will do. <laughs> hey, guys, thanks for your patience with me. You've been really, really, uh, really great to listen to what I have to say because I know that was kind of, I said some hard things, but I appreciate you listening to me, okay? Are you going to think about what you've heard today? Yes. My motive for talking to you like this and saying these hard things is because I love you, I care about you. And I don't want to see you in hell. That would horrify me. I want to see you in heaven. And I did see the dog on my Snapchat before, but I wasn't sure exactly um, what it was all about but okay. until now. So it's a really fun experience. Does this make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're going to do something about this? You're going to get right with God? Are you going to answer the, you're going to be an answer to the prayers of your mom and dad? I guarantee they pray every day for your salvation because they know you're in terrible danger with God's wrath abiding you. They, they want you to come to repentance and trust the Savior. Turn from your sins. Be that prodigal son that turns to God and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Make sense? Makes sense, 100%. So what did you say, David? 
I said that's crazy because I was talking about the same things that we were just talking about with my friend last night. We we're talking about how we we're gonna change and stuff, and I was saying, how do you know we're gonna still be, you know, alive? Like he was talking about five months from now. You know, we don't, we might not be here five months from now. We might not be able to actually make that change. Why not do it now? You're gonna think seriously about this. I definitely will. Wani, when you when you do that, you'll be born again. It's not like turning over a new leaf. It's a brand new book. God makes you a new person in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And so you'll be born again, new heart, new desires, and you'll have a knowledge that you have everlasting life because your faith is in Jesus and not in yourself. Does this make sense? Yeah, it does. The Bible says, Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. Broad is the path that leads to destruction and many go on that way. So make sure you're on the straight and narrow path. And I hope that fear has done its work and you'll see it as a friend. The Bible says, Through the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. But you'll let go of your sins and say, this is deadly serious in God's eyes, not my eyes. A little bit of theft, a little bit of lies, whatever. Everybody does it. But in God's eyes, it's worthy of the death sentence. It's deadly serious. So are you going to give it serious thought? Well, yeah. Do you have a Bible at home? I do, yeah. When did you last read it? Oh, it's been a while. <laughs> you need to dust it off because this is your eternal salvation. So you're going to think about what we talked about today? Yeah, I will. You're going to seriously think about it? I am thinking about it right now. This is your eternity. This is your precious life. So examine my motives. I'm not saying join a church. I don't want your money. I just love you and I care about you and want to see you saved. So would you give that some thought too? Yeah, I will. B, I've only known you for about five or ten minutes, but I love you, I care about you, and the thought of you ending up in hell horrifies me. It takes my breath away. I'm terrified for you. Now, what did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Forgive them. Ask for forgiveness. No. I have no clue then. Man, you have, you've you got a cross hanging on your ear. Look at it. Jesus died on the cross so you could have everlasting life. So appropriate that cross to your life and God will make you a brand new creature. Give you a personal miracle. Make you a brand new person that loves that which is right rather than that which is wrong. So you're going to think about what we talked about? Yeah, actually. You're going to have serious thought? Yeah. If you were standing on the edge of a cliff with your toes over the edge, it was a thousand foot cliff, would that be scary? Terrifying. That fear, is it a pleasant feeling? Not at all. Terrifying. Is the fear good or bad? I think both. It's actually a good fear because terrifying though you feel, it's going to make you step back. The fear will say, back off, back off now. Your life is in danger. So fear can be a friend, and in the case of today when you've realized that you've sinned against God, that uncomfortable feeling that you felt when I was taking you through the commandments and you realized your plight is a horrible feeling. It's called conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's a sense of guilt like a criminal gets when he's standing next to a police officer. He wants to run away. But that fear is good if it drives you to the cross. It makes you step back from that precipice and realize that you're in great eternal danger. And say, it makes you say, I need a savior, I need God's mercy, I need forgiveness because I've been doing things I know I shouldn't. My conscience has condemned me and on judgment day I'm heading for hell unless God extends his hand of grace and mercy towards me. And the Bible says he's rich in mercy to all that call upon him. Steve, death is serious. Sin against God is serious. Hell is serious. More serious than a heart attack. And I want you to please... Consider your sins. Consider those secret ones you thought no one had seen, those sexual imaginations. Say, man, I'm in big trouble. I need a Savior. I need to trust in Jesus. The minute you put your faith in Christ, you'll pass from death to life. God will save you from death and hell. And I've shared with you the gospel. It's the truth, and it's, it's provable. All you have to do is do what the Bible says, repent of your sins and trust in Jesus, and you'll pass from death to life. If you want a, a personal miracle, God will give it to you by making you a brand new person. See, the first time you're born, radical. You weren't here, then you were. When you're born again, when you come to Christ, it's just as radical. That's your personal miracle. God will give it to you. And nothing will deter you from your trust in God because of what Jesus did on the cross. Not even death. If you're going to die tonight at 12 o'clock, you give it serious thought. But you could die before then. 150,000 people die every 24 hours. So please don't put it off. Just give it some thought. Serious thought. Think of your secret sins. Think of what God has done through the cross. Think that he's offering you everlasting life and then say, heaven is better than hell. Pleasure is better than pain. Life is better than death. Hey, thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I appreciate you uh, asking questions, you know. I mean, it's 
pretty good to have like a civil conversation with someone, you know, open mind, you know, have a new mindset of thinking, you know. Especially with a subject. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not really that educated on religion, I mean, but, I mean. So yeah. you got to think about it. Yeah, I'll think about it. That I've, I've watched your videos a couple of times before and it catch my attention. And I always thought to myself, like, would I ever experience that encounter, you know, and I just brushed that off, but it's like out of nowhere. And that's when I just thank you and appreciate it for this talk. You know, it already gave me light and opened up, you know, my heart and my mind and what we talked about. And I, I thank you for that. So you're going to think about what we talked about? A lot, yeah. You're going to get right with God? I'm going to do my best. Well, I need that parachute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I'm going to do my best. If, if I was offering you a parachute, you wouldn't say, I'm going to do my best. You're going to say, give me the parachute right now. And the Bible says today is the day of salvation because you're not going to be here tomorrow. Death could seize upon you. 150,000 people a day die. So can I pray with you? Would that embarrass you? Not at all. Father, I pray for B. Thank you for his open heart, for his honesty of heart and admitting his sins. And I pray he'll understand the cross. They'll understand his sinfulness, understand your holiness, and find a place of true repentance. Father, I pray for David. I thank you for his open heart and his desire to get right with you. I pray today he'll see his sin in its true light, and he will tremble at the fact that he sinned against you and at the fact of Jesus dying on the cross for him. I pray he'll gain understanding, truly repent, and trust in Jesus and pass from death to life this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gracias por sintonizar a nuestro programa de televisión. Ahora puede visitar nuestra página web donde encontrará una gran cantidad de recursos gratuitos. Se puede inscribir a nuestro boletín informativo y puede visitar nuestra tienda en línea para adquirir nuestros recursos de evangelismo. Síguenos en redes sociales a través de Facebook en nuestro canal de YouTube en español y también nos puede escribir a través de nuestra página web haciendo clic en nosotros y contáctenos. Gracias por su apoyo y no olvide visitar nuestra página web en español.livingwaters.com.